welcome to the allen school cse colloquium series today's speaker is ron rothblum um he got his ph d at weizmann institute and is now a postdoc at mit and he's been working on ways to verify computations that we are paying other people to do for us so very interesting topic okay thank you for the introduction paul and uh Thank you for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so the title of the talk is How to Prove the Correctness of Computations. But before I, I tell you about proving the correctness of computations, I'd like to tell you a little bit uh, about myself and about my research more broadly. So my main research area is cryptography, which is basically a field that deals with enabling uh, collaboration between mutually distrustful parties. Uh, much of my research also touches upon aspects of complexity theory. I graduated two years ago from the Weizmann Institute, where I was very fortunate to be advised by Odette Goldreich. Um, prior to that, I spent five years as a security software developer. So I have uh, quite a bit of experience also on that aspect. And currently, I'm a postdoc at MIT. I'm hosted by Shafi Goldwasser. So broadly speaking, my research can be uh, subdivided into uh, four different areas. The first one is this uh, problem of verifying correctness of computations. And that's going to be uh, the focus of the talk today. So I'll spend quite a bit of time telling you about, uh, about that aspect. I did also want to mention some of the other things that I've worked on. So one of them is this really cool notion of homomorphic encryption. So basically the idea that you can compute on encrypted data. I'm going to uh, touch upon that area also during this talk. Another area which I won't have time to describe uh, my contributions to is the field of pseudorandomness. So basically a field that deals with constructing uh, usually explicit and deterministic objects that have some random-like behavior. A fourth aspect that I've kind of started off my career looking at and have recently started revisiting is kind of the foundations of public key encryption. Currently, all the public key encryption schemes that we know are kind of from uh, three, four, or maybe five different very uh, specific assumptions. Is there some common uh, structure uh, to the hardness that gives as public key encryption. That's something that I've recently uh, been revisiting. But the focus of this talk is on verifying the correctness of computations. And to explain what I mean by that, I want to focus on uh, one of the prominent challenges in, in the field, in cryptography, which is the problem of outsourcing computations. So here's a scenario that I want you to think about. We have some weak computational device, such as a, a laptop or, or a smartphone, that wants to compute some complex function f on an input x. So think of this function f as taking a cubic time, and cubic time is too much for our laptop. So we, what we'd like to do, our natural approach, is to outsource this computation to an external server, which is usually thought of as kind of this cloud. Okay, so our, our device sends over the input x to the cloud, gets back the result y, which is equal to f of x. So it's a very natural solution, widely used in practice. However, what I'd like to argue is that we don't want to just blindly trust the cloud. And there are a variety of reasons why you wouldn't want to trust the cloud. Let me, let me spell out a few of them. So for one, this cloud may be some competitor of ours. It ha may have some financial interest that is not aligned with ours. It may have some uh, interest to uh, be deceptive. Even simpler than that, you know, we're asking this cloud to compute f of x for us. Maybe it wants to save its own resources, not compute f of x, and give us some arbitrary answer why. If we don't trust the cloud, how do we know that's not the case? And you know, even if you do trust the cloud itself, you might have hackers break into the cloud. You know, all of us are using the same cloud service, then there's a lot of incentive for hackers to break in. So all this leads, all this leads us to the conclusion that we don't want to just blindly trust the cloud. Once you don't trust the cloud, there are multiple security uh, considerations that come up. And I want, want to focus on the two key ones, which are that of correctness and privacy. So by correctness, I just mean this kind of almost triviality that, that I uh, just mentioned. The cloud claims that uh, f of x is equal to some value y. Why should we trust it? How can we ensure the correctness of the computation? That's a problem that I've been really fascinated uh, in and I've worked on quite a bit, and that's going to actually be the focus uh, of the talk today. I did also want to mention a second key concern, which is that of privacy. But right? if we don't want to trust the cloud, why would we want to send over our potentially secret and sensitive data x to the cloud? Maybe our input contains our bank accounts, our, our uh, medical records. Right? So we don't want to just uh, share X in the clear with the cloud. And this is very much related to the problem of homomorphic encryption, which I'm very much interested in and I've worked on as well. But for this talk, we're going to ignore the privacy aspect. 
and focus only on correctness. So you can think of the input x as being some, something public that everyone knows, and I just want to prove to you that y is equal to f of x. So how can, I, how can I convince you that y is equal to f of x? Well, one thing that you could always do is have the laptop just compute f of x by itself and compare with y. But of course, that defeats the entire purpose of outsourcing the computation. So we, what we really like to do is to have the cloud prove to the client that the computation was done correctly. Now, what, what do, exactly do I mean by proving? So the notion that seems most relevant is the notion of an interactive proof. It was introduced uh, more than 30 years ago by Goldwasser, and Mikali, and Rakoff. It's really a, a seminal notion in, in complexity theory and the theory of computation. So the idea in an interactive proof is very similar to our context. We have a prover P that's trying to convince a verifier V that f of x is equal to y. Okay, very similar to, to us. In our case, the prover is simply uh, the server, and the verifier is our device. What does it mean to convince the verifier? We basically have these uh, completeness and soundness properties. Completeness is this almost triviality, which just says that you know, if it's the case that f of x is actually equal to y, then our prover will convince us. That's kind of uh, obvious. The second aspect is uh, soundness, which basically says that if f of x is different from y, meaning that uh, the cloud is trying to cheat, then there's no strategy that it could uh, use that would convince our verifier to accept. And here we're going to allow some uh, negligible probability of error. So this happens with, let's say, overwhelming probability. Okay, so that's completeness and soundness. And it does seem like an interactive proof is the right notion that we want to consider. However, it turns out that in uh, almost all of the results that have been developed in the literature on interactive proofs and in complexity theory, the, the focus has always been on the efficiency of verification, but not on the efficiency of proving the statement. In particular, in many of these results, the complexity of proving is exponential. So if you have this cubic time computation and you want to prove that you've computed it correctly and it takes you exponential time to prove correctness, that's not uh, uh, something that we're, we're happy with. So rather, we want a more refined notion. And in recent years, we've been calling this a doubly efficient interactive proof. And it's kind of a special type of interactive proof. So. Uh, we, we still have the prover and verifier. The prover is trying to convince the verifier that f of x is equal to y. But we're going to add two very strict efficiency constraints. So both proving and verifying need to be efficient. How efficient? Well, the complexity of proving should be kind of proportional to the complexity of computing the function. So if the function is computable in cubic time, then proving shouldn't take much more than cubic time. OK, so proving should be relatively efficient. What about verifying? Well. We really want verifying to be super efficient. In particular, if we have this cubic time computation, we want verifying to be less than cubic time, so quadratic or even linear time verification. Okay, so that's a notion of a, a doubly efficient interactive proof where both the prover is relatively efficient and the verifier is super efficient. But now comes the question, you know, we have this particular function f that we're interested in outsourcing. Can we prove it's correct, that we've uh, computed it correctly on the input x? So what is the power? of this notion of doubly efficient interactive proofs. So before I tell you what the results are more precisely, I want to give you kind of a bird's eye view of what we can show. And these results are based on joint works with Yael Kalai and Ron Raz, and a recent work from last year with Omar Reingold and Guy Rothblum. What we show is basically the following. For any polynomial time function that you're interested in computing, so cubic time or, or larger polynomial, any uh, computation that you're interested in doing, we can prove correctness so that verifying the correctness will only take, will take almost linear time. The almost here is just hiding some polylogarithmic factors. So in some sense, verifying is proportional to just more or less reading the input. Okay, so uh, verification is quite fast. Actually, in some settings, we can even get sublinear time verification. So you don't even need to read the entire input. So verification is as fast like we wanted. What about proving? That was kind of our, our key concern. So proving is also going to be polynomial time. So it's most a polynomial overhead involved in proving. Actually, in the recent work, we get the, the overhead to be only linear, meaning that if you're outsourcing a cubic time computation, the time that it takes to prove correctness is uh, just a bit more than cubic time. Lastly, and I think a really interesting aspect, 
is that the entire interaction only uh, takes a constant number of rounds. So even if you're considering a very, very large input length, the entire interaction is just a constant number of rounds. As a matter of fact, in some settings, we can get this constant to be just one, meaning that the entire interaction works as follows. You send over your input x to the server, maybe together with some sort of uh, short challenge. You get back the result y and some kind of proof. You run in linear time, and you're convinced. OK? So that was kind of the high level uh, view of the results. In order to tell you what we can show more precisely, I have to be a little bit more specific about what exactly is the gu guarantee of correctness that we're providing. And we've actually uh, been considering two different uh, notions. The first one is a really strong notion. It's called uh, unconditional or statistical correctness. And it basically says the following. Suppose that it's the case that the, the, the cloud is trying to cheat. It sent over y, which is not equal to f of x. Unconditional or statistical correctness says that for any even inefficient uh, cheating strategy, even one that takes exponential time, maybe solves an np complete problem, so uh, even an inefficient cheating strategy will not make us uh, accept other than with some negligible probability. Okay, and I, I, want to, I want to emphasize that there's a huge gap here between the complexity that I want the honest prover, the guy that's genuinely trying to prove to us that f of x is equal to y when that's the case. So that guy should be polynomial time. He should be efficient. But the guarantee that we're providing is that even if you run an exponential time, you won't convince us, uh, you won't convince our verifier to accept, other than some negligible probability. It's a really strong guarantee. The second notion that we've considered is called computational correctness. And it's kind of taking a more pragmatic approach. It's saying, you know what? The actual adversaries that we're up against, they don't run an exponential time. They don't solve NP-complete problems. They're also polynomial time algorithms. So the guarantee here is weaker. It says that if it's the case that f of x is not equal to y, there is no efficient, meaning polynomial time, cheating strategy that will convince us uh, otherwise. OK? I'm worried that, uh, that you know, that you could cheat on some inputs. You know, there's there's yeah. you know certain problems that may be intractable on arbitrary inputs, but it's only cheating on the inputs I gave. Right. So the guarantee that we're providing here is for every input. So for every input x, if uh, the, so, fix whatever worst case input that you're interested in. If the server is now claiming that it's equal to that f of x is equal to y when it's not the case, then this definition says that our uh, Verifier should reject with high probability for any input. So high probability that it will reject. Does the server know what verifier is going what verifier is going to reject against? So we'll talk about the solutions uh, more. In, in in some of the solutions, the prover uh, already knows in advance. It basically has it, its arms are twisted. It has nothing that it can send. That, that will convince the verifier, and it knows this. It knows that the verifier is going to reject. In other solutions, the verifier has some kind of secret hidden state, and the prover doesn't know. Uh, so in different solutions, uh, the answer would be different to your question, but it's a good point. OK. So we have these two notions, uh, unconditional and computational correctness. Let's first focus on the stronger notion, unconditional correctness, the stronger guarantee. And let's see what we can get here. But first, I want to mention kind of two uh, prior works that consider unconditional correctness that we improve on. So the first work is the seminal IP equals P space results, certainly one of the most uh, celebrated results in complexity theory, due to Land, Fortnow, Karloff, Nissan, and Shamir. And what this result shows is that is basically they construct interactive proofs for any space S computation, meaning any computation that you can do with just S memory uh, bits. For any such computation, they construct an interactive proof where the prover runs in time exponential to the poly s, exponential in the space. The verifier runs in time that's polynomial in n, n is the input length, n in s. And the interaction takes a uh, poly s number of rounds. And notice that this result really won't do for our context, specifically because the complexity of proving here is quite large. In particular, even if you think about a very simple computation that just takes a logarithmic amount of space. And we need logarithmic space even just to store something like an index or a pointer. So even for such really simple computations, 
the complexity of proving here is going to be super polynomial. And of course, as you take the space to be larger, the complexity of proving becomes uh, much, much worse. So this result really won't do. A second result that I want to mention is a result by Goldwasser, Kalai, and Guy Rothblum. And what they show is actually these doubly efficient interactive proofs, like, like what we want. And they show this for any computation, for basically any bounded depth circuit, meaning any computation that a priori you could do very, very fast on a parallel computer. So you have something that you can do uh, maybe in, in sublinear time on a parallel computer. Their result gives a doubly efficient interactive proof. Beyond this limitation to uh, highly parallelizable computations, one uh, major caveat of their results is that it requires a lot of interaction. So the amount, of, the number of rounds of interaction is basically going to correspond to the depth of the circuit. Here we're talking about uh, fan and two circuits. So in any reasonable setting, the number of rounds of interaction here is going to be at least polylogarithmic, a large polylogarithmic. So uh, that's the caveat of their result. Which brings me to, to uh, the first result that I want to tell you about. And this is based on joint work with Omar Reingold and Guy Rothblum. So here, uh, so far we've considered computing a function f on an input x. Here it's going to be more convenient for me to phrase the result as checking whether x be belongs to a particular language, deciding membership in a language. And you can easily translate from one to the other. You just want to check that the pair x, y belongs to the uh, language of all pairs such that f of x is equal to y. So we want to check that an input x belongs to a language. And suppose that you could do this in polynomial time, so and uh, cubic time, say, and in some small polynomial space. So think of maybe square root uh, n space. So any uh, computation that you can do in arbitrary large polynomial time and bounded polynomial space. For any such computations, we construct a protocol that has this strong unconditional soundness in which the verifier runs in linear time, almost linear time, the prover runs in polynomial time, and with just a constant number of rounds of interaction. And I want to highlight that this result improves on what was previously known simultaneously in two different ways. So for one, even if you ignore the fact that the protocol only has a constant number of rounds, prior to our result, uh, these kind of doubly efficient interactive proofs were only known for uh, highly parallelizable computations. Here we're significantly enriching the class for which we have uh, these doubly efficient interactive proofs for any kind of bounded space computation. So that's one improvement. Simultaneously, if you actually look at the fact that it's a constant number of rounds, prior to our result, there was basically no general purpose interactive proof uh, that was known with only a constant number of rounds, basically for, for any uh, general class of computations. And that's even if you remove the restriction that the honest prover needs to be polynomial time. It's kind of a simultaneous improvement on two aspects. I also wanted to emphasize that for this result, we're not making any type of cryptographic assumption. In particular, we're not using any kind of expensive cryptographic operations like public key encryption or anything of that sort. So this is unconditional. I also wanted to mention that the fact that we're limited to a bounded amount of space is really inherent under some very reasonable complexity theoretic uh, conjectures. You could hope to improve this constant delta uh, up to one, and that's something that we're actively working on. Okay, so I want to tell you a little bit how uh, we proved this result, or kind of the high-level uh, idea. The proof itself is uh, fairly complicated. I won't be able to go through everything, but I want to give you the high-level idea and what are some of the uh, barriers that we run into. So here's the taste of the proof. So suppose that we've already managed to construct interactive proofs for pretty short computations. And in the beginning, we're talking about computations that are so short that you, just, you could just do them yourself in the beginning. Okay, so we have interactive proof for a, a fairly short computation. We're gonna take those, compose them together, and get interactive proofs for slightly longer computations. Then compose those together, and get interactive proofs for longer and longer and longer computations until we can handle the computations that we're interested in. Of course, the key question is, how do you compose together these interactive proofs for short computations. So here's the idea. So this is the iterative, uh, iterative construction. So suppose that we've already constructed interactive proof for computations that take time t over k. Think of k as being something small, maybe a constant or polylogarithmic. So we've already constructed interactive proofs for time t over k and space s computations. Now we want to construct interactive proofs for time t and space s computation, we want to extend the length of computations. So first thing that I want to do 
is kind of draw the tableau of the computation, or if you like, the execution trace. Right? So basically, all the configurations that your algorithm goes through as it's computing f of x. So you start off uh, on the left with just having the input. You kind of process, process, process for t steps until at the end you have y. So each column here represents a configuration uh, of your computation as you're going forward. And notice that each uh, configuration is of more or less uh, size s, which is the space. OK. So our approach is going to be kind of a divide and conquer approach. So let's uh, partition our computation into blocks of size, t, uh, into k blocks of size t over k, a time, time corresponding to time step t over k, 2t over k, 3t over k, and so forth. And let's have the prover send over these intermediate configurations, all of these uh, red blocks. And notice that because we assume that the space complexity is small and k is small, that's not too bad just to have the prover send that over. It's not too much communication. So now our, our verifier got all these intermediate states. What can you do? Well, one natural approach is just to, you know, we've assumed that we al already have interactive proofs for computations that take time t over k and space s, like each one of these sub-blocks. So one thing that you could uh, try to do is just recurse on each and every one of them. Right? Recursively check each and every block, that each and every block was computed correctly. So that's kind of a natural approach. Um, to this. But the problem is that if you do this, actually, the, if you uh, kind of unfold the entire recursion, what's actually happening is that the prover is sending over this entire execution trace, which is very long. It's larger than just performing the computation by yourself. So this solution really uh, won't work. So given that, try one more time. No. Given that, a different approach that you could try to do, or try to improve the efficiency, is rather than checking each and every one of these case subcomputations, just choose a few at random and only recurse on those. So that's certainly more efficient, but the problem is that you're basically losing uh, all of your correctness guarantee. And the reason for that is that you can really easily imagine a computation that's correct almost everywhere. There's just kind of one random place where you're doing a wrong step. And if you do that, you, you can easily just change the computation in one step and entirely change the output y. Now, if the adversary or the, pro the cheating prover tries to do that, in each step of this recursion, you have to be uh, lucky enough to choose a sublock on which it's done this uh, modification, which will happen with very small probability, and therefore uh, the correctness guarantee that you'll be getting will be very weak. So that also won't do. And right, so there's going to be a huge uh, error. So really what we'd like is a solution that kind of gives the best of both worlds. We want to be able to verify each and every one of these k subcomputations at a cost that is less than running the underlying interactive proof for each and every one of them. And we call this kind of batch verification of interactive proofs. And I think it's a really uh, interesting idea, so I want to spend a little bit of time uh, discussing exactly what I mean. So imagine that you have the following scenario. You have some language L in which you can verify membership where the verifier runs in time uh, little t. So verifying a single instance you can do in time t. Now I'm going to ask you to verify k separate inputs. So of course you could just verify it in time k times t by just running the interactive proof k times. But I'm asking if you can do better. Can you verify in time that's significantly less than k times t? So I know this is a little bit uh, abstract. I want to give a concrete example of the type of problem that we, we, we need to solve, this batch verification. So the example that uh, I have in mind is also kind of from a cryptographic domain, which is uh, what I'm familiar with. So consider the following problem. We want to verify that it, in, in, an integer is an RSA modulus. What does it mean to be an RSA modulus? Basically, the product of two equal length primes. OK, so we want to verify that an integer is an RSA modulus. If you just want to verify that one integer is an RSA modulus and you have uh, the prover knows the factorization, you can just send over the factorization. You'll check that you got uh, hopefully just uh, two factors, check that they're prime, that's easy, and check that their product is equal to your integer. So it's easy to check that uh, one integer is an RSA modulus. What I'm asking is, what if I want to verify that k different integers are all RSA moduluses? Okay, so here's the picture uh, you should have in mind. I have a verifier. 
which is given n uh, k different integers, n1 up to nk. On the other side, I have a prover, which is given the factorization of uh, all of these integers. And the prover needs to convince the verifier that all of these integers are RSA moduli. Of course, one way that the prover could do is just send over all of these factors. What I'm asking is, is it possible to do better? In particular, I want the communication to be less than k times m, where m is the length of, uh, of each factor. Okay, so that's kind of a, a concrete example of what I mean by batch verification of proof systems. And the question, you know, can we do this? The answer turns out to be yes. It turns out to be yes in a much more general sense. So actually, we can uh, do batch verification for any UP language. So what's a UP language? It's basically a subclass of NP, where in case you're kind of in the language, then uh, in, in an NP language, if you're in the language, there's a witness ascertaining that. In UP, there has to be a unique witness ascertaining that. There can't be two. In particular, this example with the RSA modulus is, if I am, in fact, if I, what I have is actually an RSA modulus, the only thing that con will convince me is if you send me over the factorization. If you send me anything else, I'm going to reject. Okay, so that's an example of a UP uh, language. What we can show is the following theorem. So for any UP type of language, there's a way to, uh, there's an interactive proof where you can verify that k different totally independent integers are all RSA, or sorry, are all in this language, which potentially could be checking in RSA modules, but for any UP language, check that each one of these inputs is in the language where the overhead is only going to be additive in k instead of multiplicative. Okay, and the star here is because I'm hiding some polylogarithmic factors. Okay, so we can do batch verification for any UP language. For our actual result when we're trying to compose interactive proofs together, we need to be able to do batch verification for interactive proofs. And indeed, we can extend this result. Along the way, we introduce some uh, notions that I think are really interesting, including kind of uh, interactive analog of this class UP, so interactive proofs that are in some sense unique, and an interactive analog of the notion of a PCP, which is another really seminal notion in uh, the theory of computation. So using these kinds uh, of ideas, we can actually prove our uh, first result, which gives constant round, double efficient interactive proofs. Verifier is linear time, prover is polynomial time, and just a constant number of rounds of interaction. Okay. So now I want to tell you about uh, the second result, which, uh, in which we provide this weaker guarantee of computational soundness. So the guarantee that we're providing is weaker. The question is whether we can get a more efficient uh, construction in some, in some way. And the answer turns out to be yes. And this is based on uh, joint work with Yael Kalai and Ran Raz, a sequence of two works with uh, Yael and Ran. And in contrast to the previous result, here we are going to make a cryptographic assumption. The specific assumption is called quasi-polynomial private information retrieval. So that's quite a mouthful, so let, let me uh, help you parse that. So first of all, in a follow-up to, uh, to our work by Burkersky, Holmgren, and Kalai, they managed to get rid of this quasi-polynomial business. So you don't need to worry about that. Okay, so we're just left with this private information retrieval. So, or peer. What is private information retrieval? So it's basically sort of a weak type of homomorphic encryption, if you're familiar with that. I guess the most important bit is that it actually follows from a variety of assumptions that we as cryptographers are very comfortable making. Assumptions related to hardness of factoring integers, finding discrete logarithms, or uh, geometric problems on lattices. Okay, so it really falls from a variety of assumptions that cryptographers uh, are very happy making. In particular, it doesn't even need the full power of uh, fully homomorphic encryption. So it uh, falls from assumptions that we had from the late, late, late 80s. So with this assumption, what can we get? We basically show that for any language that you can compute in polynomial time, notice that we've gotten rid of this limitation on the space. So any polynomial time computable uh, language or function has an interactive proof with this notion of computational soundness in which, as before, the verifier runs in linear time, the proof runs in polynomial time, but now it's only going to be a single round of interaction, meaning that, uh, as I said before, the verifier sends over the input with some short sort of challenge, gets back the result y and the short proof, runs in linear time, 
And that's the entire interaction. Okay, and you're getting uh, this uh, guarantee of computational soundness, which I think is quite reasonable. I also wanted to mention that in uh, follow-up work together with, with a student at MIT, we actually managed to improve the overhead that the prover has in proving correctness to be almost linear, meaning that if you start off with a cubic time computation, the complexity of proving correctness is only going to be slightly more than cubic time. Okay. So uh, uh, just to contrast these two results, so in the second result that I just mentioned, the, the correctness guarantee that we're providing is weaker. We're only providing computational correctness guarantee, and we're assuming this cryptographic primitive of peer. So having said that, with these kind of uh, relaxations, we get a protocol that's just a single round, and we can handle basically all of P, any polynomial time computation. We got rid of this limitation uh, for bounded space. And I want to tell you a little bit about uh, how we prove this result as well. And the starting point for our proof is this idea of a multi-prover interactive proof. So what's a multi-prover interactive proof? So, so far we always, we said that we have our weak device and it talks to the cloud and the cloud convinces us. So for a second, I want to consider a situation in which I have two different clouds that I'm allowed to talk to and they're both trying to convince me that f of x is equal to y. The catch though is that these clouds are not allowed to talk to one another. So in some sense, you can think of this as a cross-examination. I have two suspects, these two clouds, kind of putting them in two different rooms. They're not allowed to talk to one another. Now I can ask the first cloud a question, get an answer. I can ask the second cloud maybe the same question and check that I get the same answer, maybe a different question so that I learn more. Um, so that's the notion of a multi-prover interactive proof. So it turns out that if you allow these two uh, provers that are not allowed to talk to one another, this problem has essentially been solved since the early 90s. So we already know, that, so this is work by uh, Babai, Fortnow, Levin, and Segedi, who show that there exist doubly efficient multi-prover interactive proofs, basically for, for uh, all of P and beyond. The problem, however, is that I really don't want to assume that I have two clouds that don't t talk to one another, right? How could I ever enforce that? Well, maybe the hacker broke, broke into both clouds and can communicate. So I really don't like this assumption that there are two clouds that are not allowed to talk to one another. So instead of that, the idea will be to use cryptography to reduce the number of clouds from two clouds to just a single cloud. Okay, so we're gonna start off with a solution that involves two, two clouds and use cryptography to reduce it to just a single cloud. So how do we do that? Well, how about the following idea? We just have our device. So uh, in the previous slide, our device sent over a question Q1 to the first cloud, Q2 to the second cloud, got back a result A1 from the first cloud, and the result A2 from the second cloud. Now that I want to use uh, just one cloud, one thing I could do is just send over both Q1 and Q2 to this one cloud. So of course, that's really a bad idea. It's kind of like doing a cross-examination where you're taking both of your suspects, putting them in the same room, and allowing them to talk to one another. All right, so uh, that's something that uh, kind of, as a police officer, you really don't wanna do. So rather, what I actually mean here with these boxes is that I'm going to encrypt both Q1 and Q2, where each one is encrypted under a different key. So you can think of Q1 as being put in a locked box under kind of a red key, and Q2 being put under a different locked box under a blue key. So I send them over encrypted. And now notice that, you know, even forget about the correctness guarantee, just for kind of the honest guy, the honest prover is now getting these encrypted queries. How, how can it answer, right? It doesn't know what the queries are. So here's where we're going to use the idea of homomorphic encryption. It basically allows you to compute on this encrypted data. So even though our cloud doesn't know what Q1 nor Q2 are, it can actually perform the processing on the ciphertext and generate an encrypted answer A1 and an encrypted answer A2 and send these uh, ciphertext back to our device, which can then decrypt and see uh, the result, A1 and A2. Okay, so that's the idea. And the intuition for why it should be, be sound or why you get a correctness guarantee is that basically 
you kind of gave these two uh, encryptions under different keys, it feels like it's kind of like sending the queries to two different clouds, right? How can you, the fact that you got these encryptions under two different keys, how can you use kind of the contents of the first ciphertext, which you don't know, in order to influence what you want to do to the second ciphertext? Right? Kind of a weird kind of cross-key homomorphism. So the intuition is that this should be secure. Unfortunately, this intuition is false. Um, and this was, so doubts were raised already kind of immediate. So this idea was originally proposed by Ayelot al in 2000. And doubts about whether it's correct were raised uh, kind of immediately after that by Dwork et al. But it was left as an open question whether it's indeed uh, secure or not. So they were kind of raised doubts, but it was unclear. In a recent work from last year with Dodi Selevi and Wicks, we actually constructed an encryption scheme in which you can do these kind of weird cross-key homomorphisms and entirely break the security of this approach. And that scheme also turns out to have a lot of uh, positive applications, which I won't have uh, time to talk about. But kind of the negative news is that this approach is basically broken, which is kind of unfortunate because I promised you a positive result. So it turns out that in a separate work, together with Kalai and Raz, we showed that the intuition does hold. So it holds as long as the underlying multi-prover interactive proof that you're using satisfies a stronger notion of correctness or soundness. That notion is called no signaling soundness. What's the idea of no signaling soundness? So, so far when we had two clouds, we said they're not allowed to communicate. Now I'm going to change the game a little bit. I'm going to allow them to communicate in some very weird particular way. So basically they, communicate, they can communicate as much as they want as long as each individual answer doesn't reveal this communication. More, slightly more formally, the requirement is that the distribution of the answer A1 does not depend on the value of Q2, the question that the second cloud got, and vice versa. Okay, so that's a notion of a no signaling MIP. It's actually, even though the definition is just, uh, I don't know, one line or two lines, it's actually quite difficult to uh, really grasp and, and uh, understand and work with. And actually, if you're having a hard time understanding exactly what this means, you're actually in some pretty good company. So Einstein referred to uh, this kind of, uh, of, uh, of interaction as a spooky interaction. So now you might be a little bit suspicious. Uh, Einstein uh, was not well known for his contributions or interest in cryptography. Um, so, and as far as I know, he really wasn't. So, Really, what turns out to be the case is that kind of in exactly the same phenomena also happens in quantum mechanics, where you have messages, rather than uh, separating messages by encrypting them under different keys, you're placing them very far apart from one another. Maybe on, on different planets, or very far apart from one another. And we have this phenomenon of quantum entanglement that allows you to kind of instantaneously generate uh, answers that are satisfy this no signaling condition. So I think it's a really cool place where there's, uh, all that I've been talking about is kind of classical cryptography. There was no quantum, but there's a really interesting analogy to what happens in quantum, between uh, cryptography in this context and quantum mechanics. So that's a notion of a no signaling uh, MIP. Um, and to actually make our approach work, we had to actually construct multi-prover interactive proofs that satisfy this stronger no signaling condition. And that turned out to be uh, quite difficult. Basically, all the techniques that we had for constructing classical multi-prover interactive proofs uh, basically break down in this context. So we had to kind of uh, to do that. And in particular, we derived a complexity theoretic uh, result, which uh, basically says that the class of languages accepted by multi-prover interactive proofs that are sound against no signaling cheating provers, in which the verifier runs in polynomial time is exactly equal to the complexity class exp of exponential time computations. So having done uh, this first step, we have these uh, no signaling MIPs. The second step is basically this approach that I told you of encrypting the two queries under different keys. And when the underlying multi-prover interactive proof that you're using satisfies this stronger no signaling condition, then we can actually prove that this approach is secure, and we derive uh, our results. We're using cryptography to reduce the two-prover solution to a single-prover solution, like we wanted. 
So using uh, these kind of ideas, we prove our second result, which gives uh, kind of doubly efficient interactive proofs for all of P with computational soundness, linear time verifier, polynomial time prover, but just a single round of interaction. Okay. So for the last part of the talk, I want to tell you a little bit about what lies ahead in this area of verifiable computation. And in particular, what are the problems that I'm most excited uh, to work on? So the first problem that I'm really, really interested and excited about is actual real world verifiable computation. Can we actually take these kind of nice theoretical uh, results and actually build systems? Actually implement them and run them? And you know, you, could, you may be a little bit uh, skeptical whether this is possible, but turns out that there's a huge interest in systems about actually constructing verifiable computation schemes. And I'm aware of at least uh, 30 papers by people in systems that go and implement verifiable computation schemes. And without an exception, they're always going to the theoretical works, uh, optimizing and uh, doing various really cool improvements and basically implementing them. So one thing that I'm really uh, enthusiastic about is collaborating um, with people in systems and security to actually uh, build these schemes and uh, so optimize and build these schemes. And I think it's going to really take a joint effort of theory and practice to get this to actually work. So that's one thing I'm really excited about. A second thing is potential connections between these, uh, type, these protocols for verifiable computations and kind of other areas of CS. And let me mention uh, two areas in which we have already seen connections. So the first one is this notion of hardness of approximation, showing that some problems are not just hard to solve, they're even hard to solve approximately. Now you may be wondering what's the connection between you know, constructing proof systems for proving correctness and showing that some problems are hard to approximate. Turns out that there's a very deep connection. Um, so especially in, in the PCP literature, there's been dramatic precedent and uh, in, some sense, in some sense proof systems uh, in the context of PCPs are almost synonymous with hardness of approximation. So there's a very strong precedent of uh, proof systems yielding hardness of approximation results. And even in our specific context, there's been precedent. So a work by uh, Kalai Raz and Oded Rege from uh, last year uses the second of the two results that I talked about today to show a hardness of approximation result for a certain variant of linear programming. And I think there's a lot of promise for further hardness of approximation results using these techniques. A second connection that I, I already kind of briefly mentioned is the connection to uh, quantum computation. Right? So we already had this analogy between uh, encrypting under different keys and quantum entanglement. A different question that I'm interested in is what about outsourcing quantum computations? Right, so you're uh, maybe a classical verifier that wants to verify correctness of a quantum computation. And that's something that's gaining a ton of interest by people in quantum. The last area that I want to spend a little bit more time uh, speaking about is the area of sublinear time verification. And let me uh, tell you exactly what I mean by that and what's the motivation. Can, can we verify in sublinear time? And here's a, the scenario that I'd like you to think about. So suppose that we have some medical researcher doing some sort of statistical analysis on a huge database. Okay, so the database is really huge. And unfortunately, our researcher has kind of run a bit short on her uh, grants. She can't afford to uh, down, even download this entire database. All she can do is just kind of read random points from just, sorry, random access to this huge database. What we'd like to do is to have our cloud, which can easily download the entire database, perform the computation for us, and prove that it was done correctly to our researcher. OK, and the reason that our results don't apply is that we always said that the verifier runs in linear time, linear in the input length. In particular, it needs to read the entire input. So what can we do in the context of sublinear time verification? Can we verify without even reading the input? And turns out that the answer is, turns out the, the answer is a very strong yes, if you allow for a suitable notion of approximation. And the specific notion of approximation that we're going, that I've considered, I think it's really interesting to consider other notions, but the one that I've been looking at is following the property testing literature, 
And the idea is basically you have this language that you're interested in, that's the green area. For inputs that are in the language, you want to accept. Then you have inputs that are kind of blatantly not in the language. That's the red area. It's stuff that's very far from your language. And those inputs you want to reject. And in the, in the middle, you have some gray area in which we won't provide a guarantee. That's the notion of approximation. It turns out that if you consider this notion of approximation, a really rich theory uh, emerges. And you can kind of go and revisit a lot of classical notions of proof systems in this context of sublinear time verification. And, uh, so it's really interesting. I think we're only just scratching the surface of what there is to discover here. And that's kind of uh, what I've been spending uh, a lot of my time in the past year or two looking at. OK, so just to summarize my talk, what we showed is that it's possible to verify the correctness of basically any polynomial time computation so that the verifier runs in linear time. In some setting, as we just discussed, the verifier can even run in sublinear time. The prover runs in polynomial time, and the entire interaction is just a constant number of rounds. In some settings, even just one. For my last slide, I wanted to once again mention uh, some of the other areas uh, that I've been working on very briefly. So this notion of homomorphic encryption, which is really cool, it's something that I've, I've worked on. The reason that you're seeing Homer Simpson over there is that Homer is kind of uh, working on the radioactive material without actually seeing it. It's kind of what happens in homomorphic encryption. You're manipulating the messages inside ciphertext without actually seeing what they are. Second area that I've been, I'm really excited about is uh, the area of pseudorandomness, which has very deep, uh, both historical and uh, practical ties to cryptography. And lastly, this problem of what are the foundations of public key cryptography? What are kind of general assumptions from which we can derive uh, public key cryptography? So at this point, I'd like to end my talk. I want to thank you for your attention, and I'll be very happy to take any more questions. Time for a couple questions. Um, maybe switching from a security perspective to more reliability. Uh, suppose that on the platform I'm computing on, I know that only certain options or certain operations are unreliable. Mm -hmm. So maybe large parts of the computation always work, uh, but only, only certain times when it's risky. Can you get big speed ups verifying those kinds of computations? Absolutely. So in, in the end, proving correctness is going to be proportional to the complexity of the actual thing that you want to verify. So if you just uh, can isolate a small individual component that's the risky part, then you can absolutely. So the complexity will correspond to the size of that small part. That's certainly, like, I think, one of the ways in which you can uh, hope to implement this is kind of isolate smaller, smaller computation or more, even more restricted classes of computations and do some things better for those. Absolutely. Other questions? Uh, so I had a question about that first theorem that you showed. Yeah. Um, it was. It was an existence proof. So there, there is some delta greater than zero, right? and it applies to a class of languages with with space uh, and to the delta. And to the delta. And all so, the time into delta space. Okay. If that delta was just one, yeah. Then what does that say about the class of languages? Like, how much stronger is the result if you can prove that delta is greater? Yeah, to delta equals one. So it basically would correspond to linear space, which would be great. Currently, uh, we didn't compute delta exactly. We think it's uh, a bit like. 0.49, let's say. We think we know we have techniques now that can get us all the way to like 0.999, as close as you'd like to one. Um, in terms of the richness of computations, certainly there's a difference between like a linear space, so you have uh, uh, enough room to store things proportional to your input, and uh, and sublinear. However, I want to point out that the actual in our actual result, if you're interested in a linear space computation with uh, linear space and say large polynomial time. The complexity of verifying is just going to be quadratic. Okay, the reason for the limitation to enter the delta space was because I really wanted to insist on linear time verification. Other questions? I have one. Uh, for the uh, assumptions of private information retrieval, uh, you had polynomial time private information retrieval. Suppose it's a, a little bit bigger, do you need the full power of that, or do you actually get something uh, interesting, even if we can't quite get polynomial time private information? So uh, so the um, crypto, so we need kind of computational private information retrieval. There's a separate notion, which is a 
kind of complexity theoretic unconditional private information retrieval. So are you referring to polynomial time, or were you referring to the complexity uh, I, theoretic one? I was con uh, conflating the two. So. Okay, so in the complexity theoretic one, usually you have uh, many different servers uh, that are doing it. In the cryptographic one, it's just a single server that's providing the answer. Um, they're very much related, though. Oh, okay. But we're considering the cryptographic one. I see. Other questions? Okay, well, let's thanks Ron again. Thank you.